session of the UN World Data Forum. Twice invisible, a lack of data in crises leaves the education of internally displaced children behind. It is a time to act. My name is Moira Fall. I'm the executive director of NORAG at the Graduate Institute Geneva here in Switzerland. Before we start, here are some technical tips to help you navigate this interactive panel today. First of all, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Ambassador Thomas Gass, who is the Assistant Director General of SDC, the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, who will start us off with some introductory remarks. Thomas, over to you. Madam Moderator, dear Moira, ladies and gentlemen, nearly every second internally displaced person is a child. Out of the world's approximately 55 million IDPs, over 23 million are children. That's the size of the population of Sri Lanka or Burkina Faso, and more than three times the size of the population of Switzerland. Yet, little is known about them. Internally displaced children are twice invisible in global and in national data. First, because IDPs of all ages are often unaccounted for. Second, because age disaggregation of any kind of data is limited, and even more so for IDP children. Um, in the picture that you see on the screen, you see the consequence of this. This is what is left. This is what was left of a, of a village school after an IDP camp of 70,000 IDPs was established next to a village somewhere in the north of Jijiga. Um, Nothing is left. You can imagine 70,000 IDPs, probably close to half of them children. What, what can you do with, a, when you're with the education system in such a place? Actually, only those who are counted count in political decisions. This was a, a, a quote from, from Mr. Ignacio Cassis, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, at the opening of the virtual UN World Data Forum last year in 2020. Children in emergency and crisis situations, and particularly IDP children, are generally off the radar of political decision, including of decisions of donor countries such as Switzerland. This has implications for their immediate safety and well-being, as well as for their longer-term integration, resilience, social and economic prospects. We all must become more aware that a lack of data has direct consequences for the fulfillment of children's specific rights, their protection and their access to basic services such as education. Displacement often lasts the length of a childhood. When we forget children, when we neglect the right of education of each IDP girl and boy, we miss out one of the most beneficial investments that can be made to bring individuals and societies out of poverty, allowing access to education and hence preparing the future of the young generation. We are all aware that collecting data in crisis context is a huge challenge. This is particularly true when it comes to education. Recognizing the urgency of the situation, national ministries of education, academia, humanitarian and development agencies are taking action. The time has come to strive towards innovation and vital partnerships to close the data and education gap of IDP children. And this session is a step into this direction. Thank you very much. And we are thrilled that in addition to Thomas, we have this distinguished expert panel to discuss this vital topic with you all today. From development initiatives, from the IDM, International Displacement Monitoring Center, from the Ministry of General Education and Instruction of South Sudan, and also from UNESCO International Institute for Educational Planning and Education Cannot Wait also in Geneva, Switzerland. So we will dive right into it, which really starting up the first question, 
which is many experts say that we will soon have reached the point where there is a surplus of certain types of data for measuring development goals, such as the SDGs. And yet there's an important lack of data when measuring issues related to emergencies and in particular, internally displaced children. So our first question that the panel will address focuses on the reasons for this lack of data on internally displaced children and the implications for their right to education. So George, let's start with a practical example. What types of data are collected in South Sudan? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, South Sudan is a country in 20, in, in 2005, we came up with that innovation of education management information system, which we normally tend to collect data at annual level. So we, uh, we call it um, annual education census. Uh, we thought it was good, but later we come to realize it really doesn't give us the right data because at the end of the day, there are so many children that fell out within the academic year. And the cause of this falling out, yeah, may, sometimes people may say, oh, okay, it belongs, to, it's because of um, poverty, but that's not true. Insecurity, sometimes the issue, and of recently, you know, the climatic factor becomes one of the most important issue, flooding. You may find that almost one third of South Sudan, because South Sudan is a, you know, it's not a highland country, it's a lowland country. So normally if it rains, you find that so many states are just covered with rain, schools are destroyed, children are forced to move, and moving sometimes to remote areas that we, even we cannot track them. So I think that becomes a problem. And then from there, we thought, okay, um, why, can we innovate a system of tracking them? Okay, but that's not what we are talking about now. Uh, the other data that we use also to collect is, uh, we use school attendance monitoring system. Uh, but the school attendance mon monitoring system is good because it collect data on daily basis, but only collect data for those who are in school, but not those who have left school, or those who have not even uh, ever been enrolled in school. So that is the weaknesses also. And um, we, uh, because of the nature of South Sudan with massive number of partners, uh, then we tend to say, okay, let us, why don't we come together and collect data in ad hoc manner based on what is happening and where. So this makes us to rely, <coughs> to rely very, very much on um, education clusters and state anchors. So they collect for us the data, or oh, sometimes also in areas where government presence is allowed, we send our people or we authorize the local education group to collect data for us from that area. So at the end of the day, we have so many data which are not even uh, verifiable which probably cannot, you know, enable us to rely on. Uh, yeah, these are the types of data we are collecting. Thank if you very much. Yeah. Very interesting to get that idea from the ground in South Sudan. And so in terms of the types of indicators and data, um, Christelle from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, what would you say about that question and what reasons there might be not to collect data in these forced displacement settings? Thank you, Moira. Um, I think the example that George just gave is really illustrative of the, of the issues we're facing. And when it comes to the education of internally displaced children, we are really facing two major data gaps. Uh, one, on internal displacement and then one on education. Um, I can tell you a little bit more about the gap on, edu on internal displacement. And um, the fact is that just as George was pointing, we are still missing a lot of information on people in internal displacement 
for instance, as a result of disaster. Um, and the 55 million figure that uh, Ambassador Gass mentioned in his uh, opening remarks is actually really an underestimation of the number of IDPs. For instance, it doesn't account for most of the people displaced by disaster. Um, and although we do collect data at the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center for about 250 countries and territories, in most of these, the data is very limited. So in addition to this, uh, it was also mentioned that age disaggregation is extremely rare. We have age disaggregation for less than 15% of these countries and territories. That tells you that in order for us to estimate roughly the number of internally displaced children, we have to use national level age distribution data. And that's how we arrive at this figure of 23 million children in internal displacement. But again, this is vastly underestimated because most IDPs are actually, uh, most displaced populations are younger than national populations for various reasons I won't get into now. But we do collect some data, as George mentioned, through, for instance, household surveys, registration data in IDP camps, or key informant interviews in various settings. The reasons why we are missing data, of course, vary from one country to another, but what we see very often uh, are issues of accessibility, and George mentioned it already, uh, sometimes also issues of security for the data collection or for the displaced people. Sometimes it is in their interest to even hide from authorities for, again, various reasons. But I think the most, uh, the most recurring issue is a uh, lack of financial resources. And I'm sure we'll touch upon this later in, in this event. But just to say that really without even the simplest numbers on number of internally displaced children, it is really hard to then plan for education and budget the support they need uh, adequately. Thank you, Christelle. And now Claude from UNESCO Institute for International Education uh, and Planning. Um, how might this affect their right to education? Uh, th thank you very much, Moira. Uh, I think it really goes without saying that without uh, uh, quality uh, data, um, when, for instance, for me, by quality, by definition, quality data, uh, mostly regarding education uh, planning and the management, we're talking about timely data, but also data with uh, consi consistent and sound methodologies, uh, data that is um, uh, disaggregated and granular enough to allow for adequate um, education planning and management. And without this type of information, it is clear that uh, the right to education for children affected by displacement are uh, threatened. And, uh, and uh, really, we, 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 uh, we, uh, we've been seeing a lot of progress, uh, of course, uh, mostly at a global level with the, um, the, the, the initiatives that have uh, allowed us to have this uh, global uh, headcount of IDPs in schools and out of schools. Uh, but we, we still lack this um, uh, qualitative and quantitative information on whether um, um, affected uh, learners are learning for those who are at school. And we still do really have uh, little information um, uh, regarding their uh, household background information because we know that uh, education happens at uh, school but also at home. And we, um, for education planning, and management is really important to have uh, enough uh, grant information on all of those aspects to be able really to provide adequate and targeted um, uh, support. Thank you. Thank you, Claude, for those insights. And then um, Harpinder from Development Initiatives. If there is a need to collect more data, in which areas or for which kinds of, of indicators, sorry, would you recommend in particular? Thank you very much, Moira, and thank you so much uh, for having me speak to you this morning on this panel. It's a very important topic, and I actually, before I go into the indicators, just wanted to back up a little and, and talk a bit more broadly about IDP data. Um, and I, one of the points I want to make is that IDPs remain in their own countries of origin. And so one of the most important potential sources of educational data and data on children is always going to be the country's own educational management information system, which uh, George and others have already mentioned, but also other national surveys. But in most low income and low middle income countries, 
we know that the EMIS, Educational Award Management Information Ser uh, System, is recognised as being underfunded and unable to systematically collect data on education in children as required. And so in low and middle income countries, educational data is already a problem. And then you add a the fragility aspect, where, which leads to internal displacement. You're already working with a system that is that is struggling, and then you're adding further complexity into it, which challenges that system even further, making national access to data on children particularly difficult. But what I wanted to bring in here was actually that there are more uh, there is more sources of data on IDPs than often we are aware of or make use of. And the IDP data uh, landscape is, although it may be richer than we think, it lacks consistent systems, which really reduces the utility of existing data for local, national and global use in particular. And I wanted to highlight the role of international agencies and the work that they do on collecting data on people. When we look at W. PF, UNICEF, WHO, if IDPs are in camps that are run by some of the international humanitarian agencies, we will find that they are actually collecting a huge amount of data on IDP children. But this data is actually circumventing the national system. And it is being utilised for those agencies to deliver services at their uh, in those camps. But unfortunately, it's not being integrated into the national system. And therefore, that consistency of passing over responsibility into the national state is often not taken forward. And so that's a very important point, I think, that we need to think, think about. is How do we ensure much greater integration of internationally collected data by humanitarian agencies into the national system to supplement national data? And your question was around what sort of indicators do we need, what sort of uh, data is essential. So I'm going to come, I, I wanted to come back to that now. We need to start off with some basics. We need birth registration. We need to have legal IDs for every single child that is born. Once you have that, it's always going to be easier to be able to track and also think about then the educational the services that need to be provided to children as they are brought into society. Personal health records, vaccination records, school attendance records, school registration records, these are all absolutely essential as critical data sources that we need. And then we need timely and disaggregated data. We've already heard the importance of disaggregating by age, but there's gender. We need to think of more about disability, geography, and being able to track people as they move within a country is absolutely essential. So disaggregation, timely data, but also data that then is, is, is linking a child right from birth is essential. But Moira, this fundamentally requires a much more strengthened national system that is integrated and interoperable across ministries and across agencies as well. And for me, this is one of the biggest challenges in, in fragile and conflict affected states where we have an international system of data collection often segmented by agency. And then we have a national system that is often underfunded and not operating as it should do. So the challenges are great. How we bring these two things together is going to be critical to the success of tracking children and ensuring they are able to benefit from the services they deserve. Thank you very much, Harpinda, for bringing those structural and systemic issues to the fore here. Before I move on to question two, just a little uh, question to the audience. Please do, as we're going through this panel discussion, with all of this rich information that we're getting, please do add any questions that might be occurring to you into the chat. And at the end of the panel discussion, we do hope to have enough time to address some of those questions at least. So please do uh, use the opportunity to interact with our panel today. So question two then we're moving on to. So over the past few years, governance by numbers has become the rule rather than the exception. National governments, international partners, as Harpender and other speakers have already spoken about, rely on numbers for all kinds of actions. And so the question here is related to the ways in which this applies to education in emergencies. 
where we do actually understand that we have certain gaps and lacks. So back to Harpender again, thinking of the various ways in which governments and organizations currently use data, what is it that you would improve and how? And then the national governments and international organizations uh, or development partners that you mentioned, do they tend to use data for different purposes? And if yes, how so? Thank you very much, Moira. If I can start off with your first question um, and then come to the second question, if I may. So ultimately, effective decision making relies on quality and timely data. And that timely data has to be disaggregated, which is the point that I and, and, and a few other speakers have already made. And we've, we've mentioned gender, age, disability, geography. Income is also a critical one. We need to actually understand where who, who is most vulnerable, what their, what their vulnerabilities are as well. But then data also needs to be managed efficiently. It needs to be in strong information systems, which are interoperable and integrated um, from multiple sources. So national governments, from a national government perspective, these data systems such as the EMIS are critical for strategic decision making. They use these systems to make strategic decisions, policy formation, budgeting, as well as routine management of education provision at that district level. So data isn't necessarily just used for monitoring and evaluation, which is often what we think about when it comes to why we need data. It's not just about thinking about how it's actually leading to improved education provision, we've got to think about it around policy formation and also budget planning as well with regards to from the national all the way down to the local level. But more than that, education data actually starts to also expose some vulnerabilities in particular vulnerable children as well. So if you've got low critical attendance, data should be able to identify children that may not be uh, making it to school, there may be other welfare issues underneath them and allow social services to be able to get involved as well to support those children. So from a national perspective, governments are using data for multiple reasons and multiple ways of making decisions, but also formulating policies and planning their services for a long term to come. They need to be able to understand how their population is growing, shrinking, moving, and if their service provision, particularly here in education, is sufficiently going to meet that need. Then at the same time, international agencies do use data differently. Often they are, particularly humanitarian agencies, where they're providing services in camps to IDPs or, or refugee children, they will be looking at a much shorter time scale. They are looking at providing service in an emergency response way. And so for them, it's about reaching children immediately, making sure they're reaching the, the, the target number, they're delivering the appropriate services, and they're also reporting back to their donors. So for them, it's got to be about uh, ensuring that that monitoring and evaluation is in place. And often they're, dis uh, they're aggregating disaggregated data to tell a story of actually what's happening at a much more aggregate level. So while the international agencies may work much more on an aggregate level and emergency response, a domestic government is looking very much at how it needs to change and adapt its own service provisions, create the right policies, but also ensure that the welfare of children across different services are managed effectively as well. Thank you, Harpender, and really showing how that humanitarian development and peace nexus really plays out on the ground. Turning now to Christian from um, education cannot wait. Christian, what information is available to support better education planning in displacement affected contexts and what knowledge gaps remain? Many thanks, Moira, and uh, good morning here, everybody from Geneva, at least. Uh, um, uh, happy to be here in this, this panel discussion. What I would say, um, I think against the, the quite negative kind of uh, sort of outlook, there is progress. Uh, there has been progress around capturing sort of IDPs and their needs and data that is available. I mean, there are several initiatives that were already alluded to uh, before. For example, uh, in, in, in several countries, uh, IOM's uh, displacement tracking mechanism has been set up and provides quite detailed data 
where gaps are in camps, for example, and that includes education data uh, barriers to accessing education, for example. Ethiopia has uh, monthly or quarterly, depending on the type of survey data, on, on those, those uh, gaps that are there. And uh, there's also REACH, the initiative, ACAPS, um, Global Initiative, the, the Joint uh, IDP Profiling Service and Interagency Service. And at global level, IDMC and Global Education Cluster do strengthen sort of uh, uh, the, uh, and, and complement those, those initiatives. And so, so also interesting, I think, on the positive side, uh, the DTM mechanism also has intention surveys, so more forward looking. Uh, looking at IDP movements and, and trying to predict some of those flows. Of course, there are many challenges, but you can see basically and use that those those data in potentially for for informing preparedness interventions. Uh, so uh, so so that could be also an interesting aspect. Then, when it comes to use of data, these data do feature then uh, you, you would see in humanitarian needs overviews, which are the basis for international agencies to, to basically form, formulate their appeals later on, and the humanitarian response plans uh, uh, that are then set up by, by humanitarian agencies uh, really uh, feature and respond to those needs expressed in those humanitarian needs overviews. So there are positive kind of uh, evolutions in terms of data availability. However, there are still like huge gaps there. One of those gaps I, I would highlight is, is that if you look at Ethiopia, for example, there's a multitude of uh, data sets and, and Excel sheets that you can access. And for, for uh, operational uh, and, and, and even like long, more long-term planners, the multitude of data sets that exist is quite a jungle to work through. So that uh, requires basically a, a special skill of uh, information managers in humanitarian settings to, to be able to analyze, understand the data, interpret the data, and really see what patterns exist and how it changes over time. Because essentially IDPs is a, is a fluid situation, is a, there are lots of dynamics, so data sets get outdated very quickly. So how do you move in this fast moving environment? Uh, you need capacity development initiatives there. Uh, for example, ACAPS has a whole initiative on strengthening uh, uh, skills around analysis of data and, and moving information managers towards more humanitarian analyst profiles. Moreover, uh, while, while many po points are reflected in the humanitarian needs overviews and humanitarian response plans, there are uh, uh, many gaps in terms of communication and exchange between the data producers, DTM, and the education planners on the agency side, international ag agencies, but also, also government. Even if uh, information flows, it's again the capacity to analyze it and use it in your operational plans. For example, if you look at uh, international agencies use something like a 5W matrix for response, for coordinating the response, and where different agencies submit where they work, uh, what kind of inter interventions they are, they are doing in these different areas, ideally you would overlay those response matrices with the needs data uh, that, that the DTM shows. However, this is rarely done. So you, you will often have gaps, uh, sort of camps that receive no support while others may receive a lot of support because operational presence of international agencies in or, or local agencies that work with international agencies are present in certain areas, but not in others. Another gap I would say is while there's quite uh, improving uh, data situation on at camp level, when it comes to IDPs in urban settings, those are much more like difficult to assess. And there's lots of, of, of uh, papers and, and, and anal analysis on, on those because there's no camp coordination mechanisms. You, there's really like really key informants that you can talk to to understand those flows to urban settings. And what I would la lastly say is what we are lacking is some of uh, many of these IDPs uh, is, is, is temporary and they may move back. However, uh, a large majority actually stays in those internal displacement settings and they do not move towards durable solutions uh, often. 
uh, and for those populations for many years staying in camps and, and these situations, you do want to know what are their learning outcomes, let's say, for example, what, what are the outcomes around development for these populations, rather than just knowing whether they have access to a school or whether they have sort of access to other social services. Uh, for that, we do not basically know uh, on a representative level for IDPs in different areas, what are their learning outcomes over time? Do they lack those skills? There are, of course, surveys more in certain camps, but we don't know actually over time uh, what their learning outcomes are and what programs also worked in what circumstances. So from a research perspective, what works in what settings that we don't know, basically. And uh, this is something uh, we, we try to promote at ECW. Back to you, Moria. Thank you very much for that, Christian. Really laying out there, along with our other panelists, the challenges of collecting data and having the right kind of data in IDP situations, the variety of them, and also that critical point about learning and education. So we're going to take a little bit more of a close look at those challenges and then some solutions to them. So George, in South Sudan, what are the challenges that you have when collecting IDB children's data and how are you collect how are you addressing those challenges? Yeah, you see, <coughs> South Sudan just is a country that came out from a, you know a protracted war conflict. So it's one of, it's also one of the least developed country in maybe in sub-Saharan African countries. So definitely we will have to know that, you know, issue of accessibility is number one, you know, remoteness. The IDPs then to move to areas where it's not easy for government, it's not easy even sometimes for partners to reach. There are some areas where sometimes we have to charter a flight and that flight only to go and see a small group of people that sometimes it becomes an economical. So remoteness is our number one barriers. When it comes to roads, roads are non-existent in South Sudan. We are still beginning to build one high road only since 2005. Uh, we also have the issue of insecurity, you know, because um, so, so many tribes with so many cultures, ideologies, uh, warlords, mention that for you to go there you have to be prepared and i think internationally you have read about sometimes even pattern has been kidnapped you know to say um also we have the issue of uh, a particular idp area is in a different warring faction uh, area where you know they sometimes develop just relations with one partner. And that partner can move there, can access, can count. But other partners, including the government, cannot move there, even if you are a senior person uh, official. But yet you are saying in South Sudan, the child has never created this conflict. The child is not a child of self our present. It's a, an international child that has the right to education and education of quality. But imagine how we are bad out. The other thing is also, you know, like in, in South Sudan, like other countries, maybe in sub-Saharan African countries, we are bordered with so many countries. And when conflict erupted, you know, it normally erupted in the border areas because that is the safer area for hiding. And then you find that that community they are come absolutely will be forced to cross the border. There we cannot track whether those children are in education or not. And as you can see, currently, peace seems to be prevailing. And then now children seem to be coming back in a very big number, settling in their villages, which we are now struggling with, um, with the uh, SS, RRC, that is South Sudan Relief and Rehabilitation Commission, you need to locate for us those areas. We are also struggling with um, partners like UNHCR in order to locate for us those areas and the children. And we are soon going to 
uh, call it, I mean, to send messages to all partners that are staying near the borders to help us on locating those children because they deserve the right to go to school. The other challenges in South Sudan, sometimes you can go to an area where you could hardly see any materials that will be used for constructing classrooms. As a result, we now agree that classroom is not a problem. Even we can be used as a classroom. But the teachers, getting the teachers, flying the teachers to those locations, particularly with a number of learners that cannot exceed maybe 50 or 100, it is another problem. Yet, these are the children who have right, you know, to enjoy education of high quality. Um, now, as still a country, a, de a developing partner country with weak, weak economy, with security situation, with floods everywhere, our strength is only working with partners. Our strength is coming together with partners. I think last week even I had two meetings with partners, including even the education cannot wait. We have to try to hammer out tools that everyone can use and to develop, you know, an oversight system that everyone can believe in. So that at the end of the day, when data are collected, data are for everybody to be used by everybody. The other strategy we have been doing, uh, we tried a bit um, since the beginning of this year, but unfortunately, problems of finances, problem of flooding, and whatsoever, it's the strategy of, you know, having a platform for integrating those viruses, huge data sets that we have. Um, coming with the strategy of, you know, validating them, and then store them, and then making them easily accessible by education partners. Uh, we also real uh, we are also working with the partners in terms of ensuring that you know when we develop a strategy or a strategic sector plan, we have to listen. It should not entirely be developmental, but it also have to look into humanitarian response. And humanitarian response in terms of, you know, balancing between humanity as well as education. I think that's very important because that's what we are facing now. That's what we see. Big problems happen. Everyone rush, you know, to, uh, to, to you know, to deliver services based on life saving. And the thing was that education is not life saving. But if it's not life saving now, but at the long term, it will be life saving because an educated man cannot easily, you know, be dropped by those politicians who simply wanted to be supported in their own, you know, politics, which is not even national politics. Uh, but more importantly, I simply wanted to say, if the society is educated, eh, conflict will be at least things of a past, and even the community will have the gadgets, the plans to resettle themselves or even to protect themselves in areas where flooding is an annual occurrence. I think that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for that, George. And now, Christian, how do we explain the lack of data in these areas and what initiatives exist currently to close this information gap in education and emergencies? And um, any regional differences? Thank you, Moira. Well, on how to explain the lack of data, I mean, some pointers were already given, I think, by Harpinder before. Um, uh, I think generally, we what we see is in immediate responses we do have a need to act very quickly uh, so we can't wait for the perfect data set in full disaggregation mode uh, because it may mean actually that lives are lost so there's uh, it's there's a need to strike a balance between speed and quality and when it comes to immediate responses it, it goes more towards speed uh, and uh, then moreover 
I mean, we are talking about IDPs. Capturing any population on the move is a particular data challenge, in particular if it's within the country where there's not like refugees, a registration system in place, perhaps, uh, where, where, where you can anchor the data collection. But it's really fluid situations that move uh, rapidly between different regions. There can be multiple displacements uh, throughout the, the course of a year of the same family, potentially. So uh, any data set gets outdated very quickly. And as Harpinder already mentioned, the, the traditional systems of governments uh, where you have EMIS systems uh, through uh, administrative data collections, which is focusing on schools, basically as, as the data collection, uh, point of data collection, uh, plus surveys that are done every few years, potentially to assess learning outcomes. Those uh, surveys every few years, they really, those systems together are really ill prepared for capturing these fast moving uh, and fluid situations uh, that we have in crisis settings. So there are basically often international agencies come in to, to support filling those gaps uh, in, 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 in capturing, uh, capturing the situations of IDPs. But these alternative data mechanisms take time. Uh, I mean, if you look at the DTM, it usually takes a few years to have set up the complete uh, system, you know, with, with routine kind of uh, every few months data collections at sites and, and, and campsites not only for them to set up the data production part, but also integrating it into the broader system. That means uh, that sharing that data uh, with humanitarian development actors and them actually anticipating and using those data sets, but also that data flowing to governments and governments integrating that data into their own uh, uh, data e ecosystem to, to respond with policies, with programs accordingly. Moreover, these, these systems do, do cost a lot. Uh, and actually having these recurrent data collection efforts, uh, key informants, uh, uh, the discussions uh, in, in different camps, the security around actually uh, having, having staff going there and, and collecting that data, it does cost, uh, cost a lot. I mean, if you look at IOM's appeal, for example, in Ethiopia for this year, it's $5 million for uh, assessments, uh, data assessment work uh, uh, generally on IDPs, uh, not, not only education specific. However, there are heavy costs attached to it. And if we want to understand their needs, these costs are definitely uh, justified uh, because if we design responses not addressing their needs, it's like the programs uh, do, do not focus on the right things. Then if I go to sort of the initiatives uh, that, that we have in, in ECW as a global fund, uh, ECW stands for education cannot wait. So there is the speed uh, kind of uh, motive already in the title, if you wish. Um, we have for these immediate responses, we have first emergency response windows. So we have three investment windows. That's the first. So that is immediate response. So there is oftentimes a crisis hits, appeal is made, and within uh, four to six weeks, we, do, we want to have uh, funds dispersed. For those situations, we often have to uh, strike a balance more towards a speed and, and sometimes not having the perfect data set to work with. And we don't want to wait for that perfect data set. Uh, furthermore, in terms of that's on the needs assessment side, uh, when it comes to response itself of first emergency response uh, or window, their strengthening data systems rarely features in the response itself. Yeah, there it's really restoring access to education. In contrast, we do have multi-year resilience programs, which are multi-year programs, which do actually uh, usually take four to six months to develop. They work at the nexus, look at development aspects as well. And there we do invest into sort of making sure needs analysis is there uh, and data is used. It's really put together and looking not only at humanitarian needs, but also the development side. We look at disaggregation of data and use whatever exists at country level, but we also work with partners to actually sometimes produce uh, uh, additional data during inception phases to close existing data gaps. Uh, moreover, these programs have a focus also on outcome measurement over time to understand what works, what doesn't, do we make a sort of a, an impact at outcome level uh, on learning outcomes, for example. 
So we have learning outcome measurements integrated into those programs. And this is for, in many countries, we have a focus on IDP children. There's Ethiopia, Nigeria, for example, Chad, Car, uh, just to uh, Iraq, to name uh, a few, is uh, there basically it's really focusing on IDPs and understanding understanding their needs and strengthening systems, including mm -hmm. data systems for IDP children. Final uh, investment window is the acceleration facility that we have. That is uh, uh, investments at more global regional level to uh, support the existing programs and the work in countries and have a focus on really at the cross-country level, strengthen uh, different systems. And one big area is data systems. So we have a big investment and a partnership that we have with the global education cluster to make sure needs assessment data is available, training for, for humanitarian staff on, on sort of uh, data analysis and, and reporting is, 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 is there at the right time, the capacities to, to move forward with the programs. And the other, uh, AF investment is with UNESCO. So Claude is, is, is actually one of our uh, partners uh, partners there with, with the UNESCO team um, and working on really strengthening EMIS and the integration and interoperability of the different data sets that uh, international agencies produce and how to integrate them mm -hmm. and really strengthen the government ownership where relevant. Now, of course, if there's a conflict like Syria, uh, um, you know, you, you have to be uh, cautious in sort of how you integrate those data sets with, with sensitivities around anonymous anonymization of data and so forth. However, that okay. is basically one big initiative and the last one on strengthening learning outcomes holistically uh, and looking at IDPs and how we can capture those learning outcomes. That's it. Thank you very much, Christian. And now, Claude, what are the key issues that you would say prevent collecting and disseminating data on internally displaced children in general, and particularly on educational needs? Uh, th thank you very much. Thank you very much, Moira. I think uh, Christian provided uh, a good coverage of what is being done at global level of uh, really the involvement of several stakeholders uh, at the global level. Um, we're trying to to to, to address all these uh, big challenges. I'm trying to I'm going to try to give a, a, an overview of the challenges at uh, uh, country level, and probably finish with a, a quick, quick overview of um, how. I mean, of course, UNESCO and other partners are supporting um, ministries of education to address that. I think for for, for me, really, the um, the um, it depends on the on the nature of the the the. the the um, displacement context. Uh, typically, we know that displacement can be either um, disaster induced uh, due to climate change uh, effects or uh, other natural hazards, or it can be um, following um, um, conflicts. And in that later case, actually, it's really um, the, probably the most challenging situation to collect data and use data in, uh, in conflict-induced uh, displacement because we know that, as uh, Christian just mentioned, we know that local authorities or national authorities might may be part of the ongoing arrest. In that context, we can uh, all understand why it's really it can be difficult to to get access to the affected populations to to be able to speak with them etc so we 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 are really talking about very very uh, volatile situations but also situations that may be um they come with um, important security challenges uh, regardless uh, of the of the despite these challenges for me i still believe that uh, today we have the the, the right uh, tools and the uh, technical tools and non technical tools to be able to have a a, a quick assessment of what's going on at uh, field level um, to be able, for instance, as Christian mentioned, to be able to provide immediate uh, response. Um, of course, striking the right balance with the with between the 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 quality of the data I would like to have and also the necessity to be able to to provide support in the immediate moment right after the the, the disaster and uh and as i said you really will have tools um to to be able to walk around any challenge and what i want to really focus on here is uh most
Oh, I think we've lost Claude's connection. Unfortunately, right, hopefully he'll be able to rejoin us and finish his thought. Um, in the meantime, Christelle, thinking of the current situation, who's currently in charge at national level for collecting the data that we need? And what are the forward looking approaches for national education ministries, development partners, humanitarian and other actors to work together in this space? Yes, Myra. Um, I'm happy to take over, but I see Claude is back, so I also don't want to steal his spot. Sorry, I was disconnected for a moment. I don't know why. No problem. Would you like to finish your thought, and then we'll go to yeah, the, yeah, to Christelle? yeah. Yeah, quickly, um, I was about to 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 share with you what um, what we do need to support Ministry of Education to address some of these challenges I just mentioned, and. Uh, um, uh, um, briefly, we are working around the three uh, core dimensions uh, supporting the enabling environment, uh, meaning that uh, in many contexts we have a lack of EIA data specific policy frameworks, which we 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 we, we understand are really uh, the core foundations at a, a country level to 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 put in place the right. Um, adequate and sustainable funding for for data collection, because we tend to forget that data collection is very costly. And this, it, there is a really a need of uh, sustained investment and also uh, not investment in um, IT infrastructure, but also investment in people. Uh, data collection is an activity that involves a lot of uh, human um, interventions at different levels. So we're really working towards making sure that uh, our um, member states have capacities to to collect data, but also to use data, because also this is an important to, 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 to put too much focus on collecting data, but also capacity to use data for analytical purposes, communication purposes, uh, planning and management. This is also needed. Uh, but then lastly, coordination. Uh, EA data is also uh, also typically a multi-stakeholder multi environment. We have lots of lots of actors at different levels intervening in data collection news and there is a need, really a need to to bring some i mean all of them together work together uh share data because um we have lots of duplications because there is no not enough data sharing among the, the different data data producers which uh, of course uh prompt so many of them to collect data on their own so we're trying to 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 bring uh, at, of course at country level but also at global level to bring the different data producers um, uh, together to share their methodologies to agree on uh, joint um, um, joint measurement approaches how to collect for instance EIE uh, data on specific items and also in making sure that we put together um, joint platforms for these data sharing to happen and uh, yeah in a nutshell that's what um, our like to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very glad we got you back there, Claude. So, Christelle, moving on to that question yes. about who's in charge and what are the forward looking approaches, please? Thank you, Myra. It's nice to come last after all these panelists because I don't I don't have to repeat what a lot of you have already said, such as uh, what happened I was saying about the fact that internally displaced people fall under the responsibility of their national governments if they don't cross any borders. So, by the book, those who should be collecting data on internally displaced children are um, national governments. And of course, many of them are. We do have some information coming in, uh, particularly in instances of disasters from national disaster management agencies. Um, but as some of you already pointed, in many heavily conflict affected or crisis affected countries, resources are lacking for national governments to do this on their own. And so they need partners. Um, and I think Christian was the one mentioning already some of these partners, such as IOM, DPM, Impact, Reach, and more. So I won't get back to that. Um, perhaps I would like to just use the one minute I might have to point at some of the most promising practices we see around when it comes to collecting data and stop filling this gap with limited resources. Um, and obviously, the best answer would be let's collect primary data on every child and every educational outcome and so on and so forth. But that's probably not possible. But there are other ways to do that. Um, we can, for instance, as we have done at IDMC, use demographic estimates. It's not perfect, but at least it gives us a sense. Uh, we can also, in some cases, use satellite images, social media data. Uh, we do have a partnership with Facebook, for instance, that has proven quite useful in the past and is developing. Um, 
And I think just this morning, actually, Claude, uh, UNESCO, the International Institute for Education Planning, released a new methodology that's really promising and allows us to estimate the number of school age children in a given local population, very much at the local level. Um, you can find it on their website. It's really exciting and it will help us estimate the number of internally displaced children at the local level who might need some uh, support for their education. And then the last point I will make is not so much on new exciting tools and methodologies, but more on the fact that, uh, as several of you already said, there is data already out there. And one of the issues is that it's not necessarily interoperable or it's not even necessarily published. So the last point I, I will make and building on what Chul already said is to really encourage all of you today on this call and all of us to publish our data sets, make sure they are interoperable. For instance, we can all use the humanitarian exchange language that, um, that OCHA is leading on um, and also join some of the alliances that have formed over the past year or two years and are really promising, uh, such as the International Data Alliance for Children on the Move or uh, the Interagency Network for Education in Emergency Circumstances that several of us are members of. So I'll end here. I know we're short on time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then finally, Tomas, on the role of donors, what is it? What are those forward-looking approaches that you would be recommending to us? Well, I, I think we, I mean, there is a mindset issue and the, both George and Christelle now have kind of show, shown a light on that. The mindset issue is actually, even though the IDPs are within a country, there should there are collective concerns. It's very seldom that you can just say it's it's that country's fault, and so let's let them get on with it. We need to there needs to be an awareness that this is a shared problem. The 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development is a declaration of interdependence. If there any significant or economic group is left behind, we don't have a sustainable development. We need to be aware of that. Um, the second, the, the, the next set of things are more practical, and that is if we're not going to deal with data and, and enhance data about children on the move, if children of the move, on the move are not our, our priority. And so putting children in, of IDPs uh, as a high priority and the education of these children in our, in our log frames and in our strategic plans is, a, is key if we want to make sure that afterwards we also strengthen the data systems uh, regarding this. Um, then we have we work a lot on, and I'm, I'm really glad Christian mentioned a lot of some of those uh, tools that already exist and how ECW is is involved. But we have we do a lot of work on durable solutions. But I I believe that the the children and the children's education in IDP children education and the data about them is not nearly does not nearly have enough place in the discussion about durable solutions. We need to en enhance that. And then uh, finally, and, and this was said also, and I, I really want to uh, underscore this, we need to make sure that our data, we put it into the hands of the national systems with all the precautions, of course. But uh, uh, when we work, I mean, I showed that, that, that broken school at the beginning. When we work with durable solutions on the governor of that province of Ethiopia, we need to make sure that we put our data and the data of our development partners into the hands of those authorities so that they can and they really take uh, uh, the, the take charge of this of this issue thank you we're not, we're not hearing you oops but not not too much we hope the subtitle of this panel is time to act so we're going to give our panelists 30 seconds to say what is the one piece of advice that you would give on how to improve the visibility of and learning outcomes of IDP children. Arpinda, let's start with you. Thank you, Moira. Um, it's very hard to say this in 30 seconds. I think we've said it all. One thing I would say is that data systems need to be built for the long term. They need to be in the interest of the countries and the people the data is about. And the only way to achieve this is where possible that they are nationally owned, just building on Thomas's point. But we need to invest 
we need to invest and build the data systems, but we need to also invest and build the capacities to use that data. So analysis, making sure that data leads to information, leads to analysis that is policy relevant is going to be critical for the future as well. Thank you. And George, what's your one piece of advice? My piece of advice is collective responsibility and probably think about mobile schools because these community are not really starting their mobile. Thank you. Christian. Yeah, it's amazing to see. Actually, I feel like we're speaking with one voice in this panel. Uh, I, I, I do would I would stress basically this uh, collective responsibility that was mentioned and, and in particular, I think the the capacities, uh, the provision of capacities and building those capacities on the ground of national uh, governments, regional governments and, and international agencies to, to really design data co uh, collection initiatives with a purpose. What is the information gap that you want to fill uh, and, and how does that translate then into better programs? Because data in itself is just a means towards supporting them in, in, in improving their lives, basically. So uh, having that final purpose in mind and sort of moving from information management kind of profiles at, at country level towards analyst uh, functions. And this is a, a steep, uh, steep hill to climb, but uh, we should invest into those capacities uh, so to, to move forward. Fantastic. Thank you. Claude. Thank you very much, Moir. Uh, for me, really, I think I'm going to be um, um, joining uh, George and uh, um, and uh, Christian. That for me, I think I really my, my advice will go uh, to uh, humanitarian and development actors, mostly those really involved at um, uh, local level, um, saying that uh, let's make the nexus a reality because. Um, we, I mean, in, in theory, uh, all stakeholders are expected to come together and work together as, as part of the, these joint planning, joint budgeting, and joint, joint monitoring activities. But in reality, this is really far from uh, being the case. And we know that if really we work uh, towards uh, supporting ministries of education, uh, playing a more important role in terms of uh, uh, leadership and coordination around the EA data protection use really will be helping a lot and there will be also uh, leaving a last a la, a la, a lasting um, uh, support and solution at country level. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Claude. Christian. Thank you, Mara. I think I'll just reiterate my last point about let's join forces and uh, those of us who are collecting some data, let's make sure we disaggregate by displacement status and age whenever possible. And then let's also make sure, and it takes resources, but let's invest in publishing this data, making it accessible um, and easily accessible to the largest audiences. Thank you. And finally, Thomas. I think I, w I don't want to give any advice. I think I want to go back. I want to go and look at this the video of this panel again and try and and understand where our blind spots are as an organization in dealing with this huge issue because only those who are counted count in political decisions. Thank you very much for those final thoughts and apologies to the couple of questions that we received that we have not had the time to answer. Um, the panel on data is not necessarily able to address e-learning, but we do know that e-learning is not the silver bullet. There were some details asked, which I'm sure the panelists answered in the later part of their comments. And we are absolutely thrilled to be able to say we were talking about twice invisible, a lack of education data for internally displaced children leaving their education behind. The panel has addressed this question incredibly well. We're very grateful to all of you. And that reminder, it is the time to act. We're not too late yet. Let's do this. Thank you so much, all of you who attended, and thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.